hyperbolic, sigmoidal, and an all-or-none response. The relationship of signaling molecule concentration to the intensity of the response can be either hyperbolic, where the intensity of the response is proportional to the concentration of signaling molecule, sigmoidal, where the intensity of the response increase much more at a higher concentration of signaling molecule, and all or none, where there is a little to no response until a threshold concentration of signaling molecule is reached, and then there is a full response. Example of all or none responses include cell division, differentiation, and apoptosis. Basically with the three examples of cell division, differentiation, and apoptosis, you can't have half of cell division or half differentiation or half apoptosis. You either have no cell division or you have the cell go through the cell cycle and complete the cell cycle and come out with two cells. Same thing for differentiation. Either the cell goes ahead and specializes or it does not. And apoptosis, where the cell makes a decision to go through programmed cell death. So in this graph here, we have the response right here and the concentration of the signaling molecule as our x-axis. So you can see with the hyperbolic response being shown right here, that as the concentration of the signaling molecule increases, the intensity of the response also increases about the same amount. With sigmoidal, as the concentration of the signaling molecule increases, initially there is very little response in the beginning of it, but then the response ramps up. With all or none, there is very little response in the beginning where the concentration of signaling molecule is low, but as the concentration of signaling molecule reaches the threshold, you get the full response. An all or none response is an extreme version of a sigmoidal response. The following molecular mechanisms are responsible for making a response sigmoidal or all or none. And the reason why we say sigmoidal or all or none goes back to what we said above, which is that an all or none response is an extreme version of a sigmoidal response. So if I was going to draw out the same graph that we have above, and this is signaling molecule concentration, and the y-axis is the response, the sigmoidal response could be something like this. This is sigmoidal. But if conditions permit, the sigmoidal response can become even, quote-unquote, more sigmoidal, starting to approach an all-or-none response, for example, something like this. This is still sigmoidal. It is not all-or-none. But if you make it more sigmoidal, more extreme, then it can start to look something like this. Where at some threshold concentration, you get the full response. So positive feedback loop and pathways. The requirement of multiple upstream molecules binding to the immediate downstream molecule in order to activate it. Example, activation of PKA through ACAP inactivation. The requirement that a protein in the pathway must be phosphorylated at multiple sites in order to be activated. Now for this part, A, B, and C, this will be explained in more detail in the accompanying video for this part. So look for that video to get a better explanation of what's going on in A, B, and C. Now a single occurrence of one of these mechanisms will lead to the relationship of signal to response becoming sigmoidal. Multiple occurrences of the above mechanism in pathway will lead to an all or none response. So basically, if you have just one occurrence of A or B or C, the signal to response ratio will start to get away from hyperbolic and be start to become sigmoidal. If you have multiple occurrences of A, B, and C in the pathway, then the response will start to approach an all or none response. Cell cycle R point, an example of positive feedback leading to an all or none response. For a cell to get past the R point, it must activate cyclin E. Once cyclin E has been activated to a sufficient amount, the cell cycle proceeds without the need of stimulation by growth factors. 
Cyclin E is activated by cyclin D. Cyclin D activation is dependent on the activation of growth promoting pathways such as the MAP kinase pathway. This is something that we went over when we were talking about the MAP kinase pathway. Cyclin E is inhibited by P27 KIP1. Activation of cyclin D leads to activation of the existing cyclin E pulls in the cell. So there is some cyclin E in the cell, but it's inactive. Cyclin D will go ahead and activate that pool of cyclin E that is in the cell. Cyclin E will activate its own expression. This is a positive feedback loop. Cyclin E will inactivate P27 KIP1 by phosphorylation, thus removing the inhibitory effect of this protein on itself. This is a positive feedback loop. This is inhibiting the inhibitor. The combination of these two self-enforcing feedback loops and other mechanisms not mentioned lead to an all-or-none response. Cyclin E will activate cyclin A, which then will activate cyclin B, and cyclin B will usher the cell through mitosis. So when we're looking at the cell cycle, and here we have G1, S phase, G2, and M phase, which is where mitosis occurs. And these are the concentrations of the different cyclins. And this one right here, nuclear D1, is cyclin D. Cyclin D will activate cyclin E. Cyclin E will activate cyclin A, and cyclin A will activate cyclin B. Now, each cyclin is responsible for ushering the cell through one of the phases of the cell cycle. For example, cyclin E is responsible for ushering the cell from G1 into S phase, where it then hands off the responsibilities of cell progression to the cell cycle to cyclin A. Cyclin A will usher the cell all the way from middle of S1 to middle of G2, where then cyclin A will activate cyclin B, and cyclin B will take the cell from mid G2 all the way through the M phase until the daughter cells are produced. Now, the R point is right here, this transition from cyclin D to cyclin E, and it's being shown right here. Now, we know previously that the MAP kinase pathway, which is activated by RAS, will lead to AP1 activation, a transcription regulator, which will then go on to activate cyclin D. Now, cyclin D will activate cyclin E. When cyclin E is sufficiently activated, you get past the R point. The R point exists in this transition right here. There is an inhibition on cyclin E by P27 KIP1. Cyclin D activates the pre-existing pools of cyclin E, but then cyclin E goes ahead and activates its own transcription and gene expression, transcription translation, so this is a positive feedback loop on cyclin E levels. As activated cyclin E levels go up, Cyclin E goes ahead and inhibits P27 KIP1. This right here is inhibiting the inhibitor, so it's an activation step. So you have two positive feedback loops working in one spot in the pathway. So the combination of these two positive feedback loops and other positive feedback loops which we're not talking about leads to this all or none response where once cyclin E levels reach a certain level, the cell is committed to the cell cycle. You're going to get the full response, which is the cell progressing through the cell cycle and coming out the other end with two daughter cells. Okay, guys, that's it for section three, and we'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.